to go. Wonderful. Uh, since we only have 15 minutes, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, welcome to this, uh, I believe, first spring session uh, in, on this, at this uh, main conference here at DevOps. Um, this is actually a, uh, well, it might serve as a bit of a teaser uh, at this point. It was meant to be a sort of bonus after my uh, uh, themes and trends session, so we kind of inverted the order here. Um, so let me start with pointing out that, the, that there are several uh, full hour uh, spring sessions at this conference. Uh, this afternoon we have Why Spring Loves Kotlin, highly recommended at 2 p.m. this afternoon by my colleague Sebastian. We have the Spring Buff this evening, 8 p.m. We have My Spring from a 5 Themes and Trends session tomorrow, 3 p.m. ish. And we have, uh, for example, the Reactive Spring session and the Spring Boot to the Dough web application sessions right before in that track tomorrow. So plenty of spring content coming your way. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, something slightly out of the ordinary. Uh, I uh, call this hidden gems because it's stuff that I slash we usually do not talk about. Not that often, not that explicitly. It's of course about Spring Framework 5. So uh, uh, just summarizing um, what we always have to summarize, right? Uh, recently released, it's already GA. Uh, JDK 8 baselined, Java E7 plus baselined, and embracing JDK 9 and Java E8 already, basically, right after after their release. Um, this is this is what's always being said, right? This is Spring Framework 5. We always do major releases when we raise the baseline. So this major version number really means something to us. And there's uh, lots of goodness following from this. Um, and I'll be talking about some of the design considerations, the decisions we've been making, and the sort of stuff that we enable going forward. I'm going to talk about uh, well, all of those things tomorrow, about JDK 9, about the HTTP 2 topic, uh, about functional API design, and of course about reactive architectures. Actually, Reacted, our reactive story is much more comprehensively covered in the two preceding sessions, Spring Boot to the Dough web applications and the reactive session. Anyway, those are the topics, basically, uh, the main topics in all Spring 5 presentations, and I'm going to go uh, through them tomorrow. So what about today? We have quite a few things in Spring Framework 5 that don't immediately materialize, or don't immediately um, show up at the surface level. For example, we uh, revised our logging approach, um, but not as radically as some people wanted us to. Uh, there's the good old problem of uh, commons logging, um, formerly, formerly uh, Jakarta commons logging, uh, now basically a regular Apache commons thing still. For better or for worse, lots of the Spring ecosystem are coded against the commons logging APIs, not just internally, but also in class hierarchies, in extension points where logger variables are being exposed to potentially user-declared or third-party declared subclasses. So we are in a binary compatibility situation where we can't easily change the uh, logging API type that we're exposing in several places. And for, the, for, the, uh, uh, be for a better migration story in the ecosystem, it's also a, a very nice thing to do uh, to keep existing logging code uh, in action. So what did we end up doing? We implemented our own commons logging bridge. So if you start using Spring Framework 5 or, or Spring Boot to the Dough, which is built on it, you'll actually get a different default logging bridge. It's not the standard Apache commons logging implementation, but it's not uh, JCL over SLF4J either. It's a logging bridge of our own called Spring JCL, the only required dependency that Spring Core comes with these days. And it comes with a, a, a few really nice benefits. It does what everybody wants us to do in terms of the overall context, provide first-class support for Log4J2, of course still for SLF4J and Logback, and for Java Util logging. Everything else is end of life at this point. So uh, we implemented that directly in our bridge. There's no need for custom excludes in your POMs, no need to exclude comments logging from the Spring Core dependencies just to bring in JCL over SLF4J. Basically, remove all of this. No extra bridges, no custom excludes. The uh, standard bridge, the default bridge that we're shipping in Spring Framework 5 should actually work for almost every regular use case. If for some reason you still want to use JCL over SLF4J as your bridge of choice, exclude Spring JCL and include JCL over SLF4J as you always did it. So we're not taking anything away either. 
as you might um, notice, there's log4j2 is actually uh, the most important driver here because the complications between logback and log4j2 setup were really too much to uh, impose on anybody. Right? So it, it's a much, much more streamlined arrangement and keeps the entire Spring framework-based ecosystem in place, uh, exposing the same good old org Apache commons, log, uh, commons logging log references to them, as we always did. All right, um, different kind of problem, but also a little bit infrastructural, component scanning. Um, th this, is, um, oh, this needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but class path scanning, any kind of class path scanning, can be slow, depending on your deployment environment. It's particularly slow in, in some managed environments, like in Google App Engine, it can be very slow with a security manager, uh, anything that interferes with I.O. Because what class path scanning really does is it asks the class loader to find certain packages, the famous base packages in Spring, and it searches the class path from there downwards. It relies basically on class loader resource resolution. Um, and depending on the speed of this, and the, uh, uh, depending on security checks in between, this may uh, become an issue. Our usual recommendation, narrow your base packages, right? Uh, the, the whole point of the base packages mechanism in Spring is be as specific as you can in terms of where do you want your components to be found? Where, where should we look for them? And where can we just skip the entire search because there are no components to be found there anyway, right? So you can search from the root package downwards, so not specify base package, basically. Uh, it's not recommended. It actually works for small deployment units. It works for certain scenarios, but generally speaking, that's not recommended. Um, people still do it, nevertheless do it. So we recognize that there is an alternative improvement that we can provide, and that's what we're doing in 5.0 now. We're providing a components indexing mechanism, basically a build time step, generating a spring.components file, which does the search at build time, lists all the component file resource names, so we don't have to traverse anything. And on startup, we detect that in the jars that we're searching, there is that sort of spring components file, and we automatically translate your component scan instruction onto that index if uh, the conditions match, so you, if you didn't specify custom includes or exclude filters or the like. Uh, so instead of searching the class path, through the inclusion of a pre-built index file, you can um, help the framework to uh, skip certain steps of its startup procedure, of its search procedure. Uh, in particular, for wide-ranging searches. So in particular, if you do not want to narrow your base package, if you do want us to search uh, most of your class path, this is uh, highly recommendable. An alternative mechanism, the components indexer, lives in the Spring con Context indexer module, and it's basically an annotation processor for, for your compilation step. Different kind of problem, closer to the source code uh, experience. Nullability. In, uh, in traditional Java code, of course, we are, are used to, to nulls, right? Nulls passing in, uh, trying to pass nulls in somewhere, getting nulls out of it. The getting nulls out of it, out of an API, return from an API is a particularly hard, hard one, right? So we, we, had, we had the topic loosely on our radar for quite a while, but we have a strong driver now, and the driver is actually Kotlin since there was a Kotlin session in this room right before. The driver is actually Kotlin, because in the Kotlin language, nullability, uh, the, uh, the assignment to a non-null declared variable, is actually an, uh, an, a pretty important fundamental mechanism in the language. If, from a Kotlin perspective, you interact with a Java API, it is enormously helpful if the Java API has explicitly declared nullability. If the Java API explicitly says, this can be null, this cannot be null, uh, the Kotlin, Kotlin compiler makes assumptions about what you can do with the outcome of a, of a Java method call in a piece of Kotlin code. So what we're doing here is uh, we are, we've introduced nullable annotations all across the code base. The entire Spring Framework code base works with a nullability approach where uh, most packages are non-null by default. They include a non-null API and non-null fields marker. So if not explicitly annotated, you shouldn't pass in null and you will never get null out of it. Um, if we deviate from this, and of course there are plenty of places where you can get null because of the API design, the existing API design in Spring, we add add nullable, like add override basically, a, an annotation, giving you, you some help about um, 
about the, uh, the outcome. So even from a, a readability perspective, you looking at Spring source code, this can be quite helpful. It's a formal declaration of nullability, not just hidden in the Java doc somewhere. We use this extensively ourselves. In, for example, in IntelliJ IDEA, there's the constant conditions and exceptions inspection that you can uh, trigger, which basically validates your nullability declarations, if you have them, against the code, right? Can the code flow ever result in null? Or are you trying to check something, uh, whether it's null, but it can never be null anyway, right? So it's trying to optim to improve your code, catch potential null pointer exceptions, but also um, uh, removing unnecessary checks, right? So we are making heavy use of this ourselves. And of course, by shipping this in our framework code base, you may also use this in application projects. If you code against Spring APIs, they come with explicitly declared nullability. This can be helpful even for Java development. Uh, it is enormously helpful for Kotlin development. So among the major ones, uh, a fourth one coming your way. And I've got a, uh, three uh, bonus ones for you. Data class binding, it's also Kotlin inspired actually, uh, but uh, again, it's not Kotlin specific. The places where we do data binding in Spring, for example, Spring MVC uh, parameter binding, a handler method declaring an argument, and uh, Spring by default trying to bind incoming parameters or properties against a target class. This is actually smarter now. It has a code path where it detects that this is not a, a, a setter getter style uh, target object. Uh, our definition of a data class is basically what matters to us, right? To the, to the binding facility in the, in the Spring framework. Um, if there is no default constructor, just a differently styled constructor with several arguments, and you are declaring this as a binding target to us, for example, in the Spring MVC handler method, um, then we assume that you want us to go into constructor binding mode, basically data class binding mode, because Kotlin data classes, or also Lombok data classes, as sketched down there, are all designed like this. A single primary constructor uh, listing all, basically, the properties, taking them at the constructor level and then being read-only from there, and the parameter names of the constructor declaration really mattering. Parameter names do matter in Kotlin. Uh, they can matter in Java if you compile with dash parameters or dash debug, which I strongly recommend for many reasons. Uh, you can also override them with an explicit declaration with the Java Beans at constructor properties annotation. All of this just allows us to perform data binding for you through a constructor having an immutable uh, data class instance afterwards instead of having to design setter getter style mutable um, bean instances. So it's a quite interesting facility, can work in Java. Makes a lot of sense with Kotlin, in particular with the data class concept in Kotlin. And it's also commonly used with Lombok. Uh, quite a lot of Spring users, or at least a significant number, has a certain love for Lombok. Um, so we make some explicit steps. And I guess you can infer the design perspective here. Right? We're designing a feature so that it makes sense in several contexts. Does make sense in Java, might, even, might make even more sense in other languages and other variants. All right, quick rundown. A uh, few things we've been doing. We've re been revising the object provider mechanism. If you're not aware of this, let's say lookup API, you can do add auto white object provider of a bean of yours with smarter interaction against um, which variant of that object you want. Right? With, uh, there might be several such beans. You're trying to identify a certain one. Look at the new signatures. That's the Java 8 Java util function mechanism in action with Java util function supplier. And, uh, and consumer being in use here. So this is, oops, I'm sorry. Um, this, is, uh, this is our new Java 8 baseline in action, right? We can finally expose overloaded variants, even as default methods to you, using the new Java util function interfaces uh, as arguments. Like, uh, get if available, if not available, call this supplier to give me a default instance. Um, this is a, a, a part of our functional story that I'll go into more detail about tomorrow. Uh, functional as in Java 8 stream, Java util function style, functional API design. All right, uh, and in given, given uh, uh, the remaining few minutes, here's the, uh, um, a few additions to the resource API. 
Uh, so in case you're using the resource abstraction in Spring heavily, that might be a good reason to, to upgrade to Spring Framework 5 on its own right. Very close uh, NIO2 integration there. Uh, by all means, um, and IO2 available since Java 7 and onwards is uh, a key piece of uh, the infrastructure that we have in the JDK these days. We're trying to maximize our use, both at the API level, there is a readable channel, writable channel, um, additions to the resource abstraction, but also internally, where we can internally improve um, your interaction with some of our, for example, file copying mechanisms, that sort of stuff. And last but not least, uh, we also took Java time in Java 8 as an inspiration. There are several new signatures, for example, the schedule methods in Spring Framework 5, exposing overloaded variants instead of uh, longs and dates, now taking instance, uh, now instant and duration as arguments, the java.time value objects. So we're trying to be as friendly as we can to Java 8-based code, where your code might already use java.time, where your code might integrate with completable future, and providing the best possible direct adaptation uh, with no shims between our code and uh, the Java 8-based code and uh, Spring Framework-based interaction. So we really mean the fine-tuning of those APIs in several places. Um, in, in Spring Framework 5. Those are just examples. There's plenty of fine-tuning all over the code base. So in Spring Framework 5, we actually have a ton of uh, um, refinements. If you look for at since 5.0 in our Java doc or in our code base, you'll find several hundred new overloaded variants, new little classes that make a lot of sense in certain contexts. Um, so by all means, this is uh, just a a few examples in those 15 minutes, uh, or 16 in the meantime, maybe. So thanks for, for listening. If you are considering an upgrade to Spring Framework 5 though, um, explore our Java doc very uh, exhaustively. There's lots of little gems to be found in there. If you'd like to hear more about the general Spring Framework 5 design, about Reactive in particular, about the functional story, Kotlin interaction, there are the other sessions that I mentioned at the beginning. Enjoy, enjoy the overall conference, and uh, uh, maybe join us for the Spring Buff tonight. Thanks.